Good evening, friends. Let us revisit what we came across last week. Remember this chart right here where we're comparing the uh, vaccine adverse event reports coming into VAERS uh, the first two weeks of January 2022. We revisit that right here. As you can see, there's our date. And it's now January 14, 2022. So this is all the vaccine adverse event reports up to the first two weeks of 2022. And of course, here is our zip file size, and this obviously represents all of the reports. And obviously, it looks pretty innocuous and quite small compared to the prior years. Now, let us begin to put that in context. Are you ready? Revisiting this bar chart from last week. There we are. There is 2022. And here are all of our vaccine adverse event report uh, files accumulated over an entire year going from 1991 on up and let's see how that compares remember we're only looking at the first two weeks now of january 2022 and this is quite quite disconcerting all right let's bring this a little closer to bring it into context all right there we are now if you look at that right there we look at 2006 remember this is the entire year of 2006 and we're comparing it to the first two weeks of 2022 let's get a little closer again just to give more context provided we don't cut it off here there's that and let's look at that there we are there is 2022 the first two weeks of 2022 has more vaccine adverse event reports than all of the years prior, 2006, to basically when they began collecting reports and bears in 1991. Now, if you're a betting person, what do you think next week will entail Will it be larger than 2007, 2008, 2009? Will more adverse event reports come in the first three weeks of January than the entire year prior? Already, if you look at this, 2022, we've had more vaccine adverse event reports than 91, 92, 93, and maybe not so much 94 added altogether. So the first two weeks of January 22, without reiterating too often, was more or about close. The cumulative amount of vaccine reports in the first four years of VAERS reporting. That is food for thought. What we will cover tonight, let us begin. And it has been a interesting week for the runs, the ones I should say, running the pandemic mitigation strategy that may not necessarily have been the best. And I think you're gonna start seeing individuals start slowly creeping back into the shadows by their whoops. And whoops, what are we talking about with whoops? Well, whoops number one, to start off with, let's begin with the British Medical Journal. The purpose of regulators is not to dance the tune of global rich corporations and enrich them, it is to protect the health of their populations we need complete data transparency for all studies. We need a public interest in the public interest, and we need it now. What conspiratorial journal can that possibly be? Well, the British Medical Journal. And what triggered the British Medical Journal? This, you ready? When Facebook banned basically information that the British Medical Journal was Releasing the Facebook is trying to control how people think under the guise of fact checking warns editor in chief. Now, the reason that's really important for the British Medical Journal, because medical journals are based upon their credibility and professionalism. So when you have one social media organization saying basically that a very credible, long standing uh, medical organization is not being factual that sends a chilling 
I would say, feeling throughout the scientific community, regardless of basically your preference for certain treatments or beliefs or hypotheses or so on and so forth. So what did they say? Here it goes. Facebook's actions won't stop the British Medical Journal from do what, doing what is right. But the real question is, why is Facebook acting in this way? What is driving its worldview? Is it ideology? Is it commercial interest? Is it incompetence? Users should be worried that despite presenting itself as a neutral social media platform, Facebook is trying to control how people think under the guise of fact checking. Again, when you start having your main bastions of knowledge start being questioning this fact checking uh, fad that's going around right now, uh, you really have an issue that hand. All right, let's go back to what we're going to cover tonight. So basically, that's just to get you a good start. And we have a lot to cover. So let us proceed to what we're going to look at. And then I'll bookmark it once we render to 4K. So it's easy to find later on. But I like to start with some positive stuff. But let me just give you a, a quick look at what we're going to cover. Number one is basically right here. The important role of polysaccharides from a traditional Chinese medicine, lung cleansing and detoxifying decoction against COVID-19 pandemic. And we're looking at Ching Fei Pa Tu Tong. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Then after that, uh, nutritional support to increase survival and reduce mortality in patients with COVID-19, stage three com comorbidities, a blind and randomized controlled clinical trial, really, really positive results in regard to nutritional therapy. Then once again, heparin, making another showing again, coming real strong as far as being a nice potential treatment, which if it would have been researched earlier, could probably have saved multitude of lives. Uh, after that, uh, the University of Hong Kong, great study on the combination of basically it's a, it's like a ulcer medication or H. pylori medication, bismuth and N-acetylcysteine, really kick butt as well. Great, great, um, great potential. Then, two, after that, serial prevalence of COVID-19 among workers in Malaysia. Let's get this out of the way real fast because it's interesting. All right, here it goes, real, real fast. Now, we estimated 82.2% of workers have been infected with COVID-19 by July, September 2021. The prevalence was 99.9% .9 among migrant workers and 12.1% among local workers. The most industrialized region in Malaysia, where most migrant workers were found, had 100% prevalence, given an infection case ratio of approximately three. So if you think about that, I mean, you, when you have about 100% seroprevalence, don't you have herd immunity by then? I mean, seriously. I mean, you can vaccinate 100% and, and everywhere you have seroprevalence. But, you know, obviously mutations and so on and so forth. But I just thought that was interesting to see 100%. That is just con confounding. It's amazing. After that, we are looking at bah, 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 performance of commonly used COVID-19 lateral flow tests for kids below par. And that's an understatement. Nitric oxide again coming up in reference to lightning storms. They're looking at basically the, the observation and correlation between lightning storms and mutations. And where to come down to, remember we've had like three or four articles on nitric oxide? Well, now it begins to arise again. So there's a, some strong correlation there. Health declining U.S. North, uh, Northeastern pandemic. Well, let's get this out of the way too, real fast, good short. 50% report of anxiety or depression during the pandemic, 40% weight gain, 29% report of food insecurity. Individuals with food insecurity were seven times more likely to skip or stop medication for anxiety, depression, and hypertension. It goes on and on and on. Uh, 2.6 times more likely to experience anxiety, be diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Uh, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, obviously going up, food insecure, and obviously certain marginalized communities were really affected, especially the LGBTQ plus community, uh, more likely to experience anxiety and depression. And that's all brought to you by our lockdowns. And so, Interesting, and also too, to follow that up, pandemic recovery for kids goes well beyond keeping schools open. Uh, Journal American Medical Association came up saying school disengagement, mental health challenges, unhealthy weight gain, food insecurity, immunization delay, and increase in the onset of type two diabetes again. And if I'm speaking fast, please forgive me. I'm just trying to cover a lot of area. 
The toll that school closures and social isolation had on kids' mental health cannot be overstated. And what conspiratorial organization is that? Journal of, Medi Journal of American Medical Association Pediatrics. So, something to think about. And think about it too. A lot of the you know areas where a lot of kids are trying to go back to school, a lot of, um, I don't want to say, because uh, there are a lot of good teachers out there. But you could see the scenario where there is pockets of certain areas which are resentful being forced to go back to school and teaching kids. And you have to think about if that resentment doesn't somehow reflect upon the children trying to learn by teachers who obviously, for whatever reason, not all, just a small group, uh, basically did not want to be there to begin with for whatever concerns or safety concerns they may have had or whatever. You know what I mean? So there's, there's a lot of reasons why kids really got the short end of the stick and continue to get the short end of the stick in reference to what's going on. But I want to get that out of the way real fast. Uh, support for populist politics collapsed during the pandemic. Ooh, all right. Let's get this one in the way too. All right, don't go back. This is like all the gossipy stuff, but you got to recognize is, you know, to you or I that is watching this video and, and basically uh, covering the, uh, the elements that we choose or the selection bias, all because it may seem surreal to you and I, does not mean that others may not feel that way. So try to keep an open mind in regard to the research. Now, what you and I are about to doom scroll down to, for people like of our ilk, you'll find quite tough to swallow. Are you ready? Here we go. Doesn't mean it's not right. This is, again, we have to be careful of the echo chambers that we create, uh, i.e. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. All right, here it goes. Actually, YouTube has been actually really nice to me recently as far as allowing our videos to fly oh, without any, uh, without any, uh, how would you say, coercion. Here it goes. Ready for this? Some ideas propagated by populists are losing ground. Levels of agreement with statements such as corrupt elites. You ready for this? Corrupt elites divide our nation or the will of the people should be obeyed. Fell in almost every nation surveyed. All right. So let's read through this again. The idea is held by populists that there are corrupt elites and that the will of the people should be obeyed. Were the main things we're talking about. For example, agreement with four such statements fell on average by 9%, and it gives an idea of the countries. So basically, people didn't believe in the will of the people anymore or there were corrupt elites. It says, quote, commitment to these ideas has also waned. Even among supporters in almost every nation, a small number now strongly agree than did in 2019. In developed democracies, this shift is predominantly among those aged over 55, which you think it wouldn't be. But here it goes. Ready? Now comes the part that starts getting real interesting. However, some illiberal, illiberal, not liberal, illiberal policies gained traction while populations were in the teeth of the pandemic. Majorities in almost all major nations surveyed in 2020 were content with banning handshakes. And much of the public, including majorities in Japan and Germany, supported restricting online discussions of the virus. Let's see where we're going. Instead, citizens increasingly favored technocratic sources of authority, such as having non-political experts take decisions. Instead, citizens increasingly favored technocratic sources of authority, i.e. Fauci, possibly. And now it gets really good. You ready for this? Here it goes. Some of the biggest declines in democratic support during the pandemic were seen in Germany, Spain, and Japan, nations with large elderly populations particularly vulnerable to the virus. And here it goes. In the U.S., the percentage of people who consider democracy bad, a bad way to run the country, more than doubled from 10.5% in 2019 to 25.8% in 2021. I will reiterate this. Let's bring this up a little higher, put it right in the middle of the screen, because this blew me away. Again, biases, we all have our biases. I have my biases. And I have my biases where I find this tough to believe. But however, though, if this author of the study is correct, 
we have a little bit of an issue, at least if you're pro self-determination and independence. In the US, the percentage of people who consider democracy a bad way, bad way to run the country, country more than doubled from 10.5% in late 2019 to 25.8% in 2021. And of course, that just means to me, we have to end this, uh, this uh, lockdown scenario or philosophy or whatever it is pretty soon. All right, then we're going to be covering some new side effects, uh, possibly for reactions to vaccines. Uh, Kawasaki disease, atypical, and I'll move this real fast because I took too much time on the other one. Uh, polyneuritis cr uh, craniolis uh, associated with the, basically this one there, the other vaccine. And then we'll go through the editor's call for COVID-19 uh, vaccine and treatment data to be available to the public and scrutiny. Uh, the BMG, the Facebook, uh, we'll go more through the article on that. And Facebook does have a right to um, state their case. So, but I would really curious what Facebook's case is. So anybody that works for Facebook, please feel free to chime in. Uh, what is the rationale behind uh, basically censoring the British Medical Journal? Uh, then two, Vaccine used much of the world, no match for Omicron variant. Again, we're looking at one of the vaccines used primarily in China, the Sinovac. And then, uh, yeah, seroprevalence for, um, we'll look at this once again. Vaccine effectiveness has a negative 0.6. Vaccine efficacy against Omicron when there's just two doses of the vaccine. For those that are familiar with a negative vaccine efficacy it makes you feel like for example they are getting the booster per se wherever that went uh just to cover up the fact that two shots have a negative vaccine efficacy potentially and hang on we'll be right back and we shall begin hang on i am back and once again please forgive me if i'm speaking kind of fast because we have a lot of ground cut to cover i'm gonna move this mic just a little bit there so if you're a sound that's me moving the mic so let us begin. And the first one I want to start with, and I promised to bring this up earlier, the important role of polysaccharides from a traditional Chinese medicine, lung cleansing and detoxification, detoxification, detoxifying decoction against the COVID-19 pandemic. Please forgive me if my pronunciation is not great on this. I believe it was Ching Fei Pai Tu Tong. And if I'm wrong, please correct me. I don't mean no disrespect, but this one little formula right there, Ching Fei Pai Tu Tong has got really had a lot of real traction in China for quite some time. So much so, now let's just cut to part of the line right here. The National Health Commission from the People's Republic of China and the 6th and 7th edition so far, respectively, said, quote, that the lung cleansing and detoxifying decoction is recommended for all COVID-19 patients. Now, the interesting part about this one article, which I will link, is as follows. They do a wonderful job giving you basically all of the components of the formula itself, the Ching Fei Pai Tu Tong. But however, though, they bring up one important part, that basically the active ingredients remain unknown. So let's bring up a little highlights from the study itself. So... However, traditional Chinese medicine has been playing a critical role in prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation of the COVID-19. The lung cleansing and detoxification decoction, Ching Fei Pai Tu Dong, uh, basically which they're talking about. Specifically, 214 confirmed cases in four provinces were administered this drug, three treatment courses between January 27th and February 5th, 2020. More than 60% of the patients showing obvious improvement in symptoms and computed tomography manifestation and remain 30% being stable without deterioration. 60% showing obvious improvement. Now keep this in mind. We're looking at this formula here. Look at your dates. That was, I believe, D614G strain. That was an extremely lethal strain that caused all the lockdowns to occur. Now we have Omicron, which is like a kitten compared to D614G. Uh, but however, though, and the remaining 30% being stable without deterioration. Now, obviously, 60 and 30 is 90, but who knows what happened to the 10, but still just the same. 
Uh, as a result, the lung cleansing and detoxifying decoction was deployed in four mobile uh, hospitals in the epicenter, Wuhan, where were temporary hospitals were quarantined mild cases. The decoction showed satisfactory efficacy with nearly all patients recovering. Now, see, here's my problem. Is if this really had that impact, that solid impact, you already know where I'm going with this. Why not here? What was the problem? If this was well studied and it had an outcome that favorable in basically the heart of where the pandemic began, why is it not utilized more often? To begin, from the symptoms of fever, fatigue, and cough, according to the data collected in 66 designated medical institutions in 10 provinces, stated by the National Administration of Chinese Medicine. And of course, as we reiterate once again, the National Health Commission of the People's Republic of China, the 67th editions, da da da, between that time, da da da, uh, basically said it was recommended for all COVID 19 patients. Interesting. The active ingredients, of course, remain unknown. Now, there's been multiple studies uh, since then. And if you go to review through the NCBI and other places like that, you're not going to see any studies that speak negatively of it. So what's the problem? Again, I don't know. Uh, but here is all the ingredients that comes together. And that's what they're recommending. And if they, that, if they have that type of outcome with the patients, yeah, it's like so why have we, why did we not incorporate it here when we had the opportunity? All right, to proceed forward, next one. And I'll have the link for you as well uh, so you can look at this article on your own in more detail. My objective is only to bring the information and present it, and then you take it from there. Effective nutritional support system to increase survival and reduce mortality in patients with COVID-19 in stage 3 and comorbidities. A blinded, keep that in mind, randomized controlled clinical trial. So we're talking pretty good research. It may be small. We know what the power factor is, so on and so forth. But let's get to the highlights. All right. Here we go. Here we are. This gives a great idea of how effective it was. Patients who survived had a follow-up on day 40. Analysis of basically SpO2 with supplemental oxy uh, without supplemental oxidation, oxygenation. oxygen was performed. In the control group, and... This is the intervention group. You see right here, control group, intervention group. Intervention group got the great diet. And let's let's give you a breakdown of this chart. Well, let me do this first. Um, the intervention, uh, intervention group presented a mean of 92.8%, which implies greater progression in SpO2 in favor of da, 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 da. You'll see what it means in a second. A discharge, 85.2% of the control group and 66.7% of the intervention group required the use of home oxygen use. All right, so benefit there. The control group, the people not doing the diet, which is recommended here, presented a mean of 57.6 days, while the intervention group, 43.8. Remember, we're talking people pretty seriously ill. A 13.8 day average reduction. Ah, let's just get, uh, and then, wait, check this out, check this out, right here. Post-COVID, remember when we talk about long COVID and things like that? 37.75% of the people in the control group had that, compared to 23.5 in the intervention group, the one with the diet. Now think about that. If the diet, for example, the intervention group can actually help reduce, uh, reduce, I should say, long COVID type symptoms, then wouldn't that be a great thing to incorporate as well? Let's look at this chart. And this will explain it more in detail. All right, here we are. And of course, the chart's really small. We're going to make it bigger. Do, 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 do. Super big. That's good. You should be able to read that fine when it uh, goes to 4K. So look at this. It gives exactly what they recommended. The spirulina, maxima, folic acid, glutamine, vegetable protein, ascorbic acid, zinc, selenium, caliciferol, resveratrol, omega-3 fatty acids, L-arginine or arginine, and magnesium, mag, no, magnesium, magnesium for 21 days, B-complex, IV, and saccharomyces boulardii for six days. Look what the results were. Ready? Let's bring this up just a little higher. Yep, it's not going to go higher. Can we make it bigger? Let's see. There, right there. Here we go. And check this out. Survival. 
97.5% versus 82.5%. Mortality, they had one mortality, one person to come versus seven in the control group, 17.5 to 2.5. Look at that, 2.5 to 17.5%. Seriously, again, another question. You know, it. I mean, it's it's mask distance inoculation. You know, the argument really truly is the immune and the non-immune. It is not about the uncertainty of whether someone complied with a certain medical treatment, and if their medical and if it doesn't work, it must be the fault of the people which are not complying. No, it's really the fault of the fact is there's a lot of wonderful science out there, and people are stomping their feet, and people are paying a price for it. Because obviously there are a lot of things out there that can help people and they're not being incorporated for whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, progress in medical, mechanical ventilation, 17.5% versus only 7.5%. Uh, survival in patients with mechanical, mechanical ventilation, one mortality versus five. Uh, less of need for supplement oxygen, so on and so forth. You get the picture. Are we truly doing everything we can to help individuals? Uh, good question, isn't it? And let's see. Da, da, da. Can I get past here? And we did. Now it's huge. All right, hang on. Let me slow this a little bit. Let's get down to maybe like 200%. Still pretty darn big. So you get the you get the idea there. And the wonderful thing I like about this article is the fact is math is recovery once before, but it goes through all the detail of every supplement they utilize. And the rationale, let's make this a little smaller too. And the rationale they utilize in order to basically why they incorporated that into the intervention group. Very simply laid out, any medical professional can actually get into it, look at it and see the hypothesis, the conjecture and the speculation, the predication in order to use such a dietary format in reference to helping people live. I mean, 17.5% to 2.5% that should be incorporated in every hospital. If anything, seriously, a decent diet with a decent intervention group. I mean, why? Again, it goes back to the Ching Fei Pai Tu Dong and good diet. Why are we not doing everything possible that we can in order to help individuals, uh, per se, outside inoculations, distance, and mask? So here we go again. Heparin. This one, again, just is a rising star. We've covered this over a year and a half ago, and it came out with incredible research. Again, why not? Here's another uh, pandemic mitigation prophylactic number 296. Here we go. Research have found breathing and oxygen levels improved 70% in patients after inhaling. Remember, it has to be inhaled. Chorus of heparin. Heparin is unique, has an antiviral, anti-inflammatory, anticoagulant, and consider relevant to the treatment of COVID the patients with COVID-19. All right. This study drug is already available in hospitals all over the world and is very inexpensive. If it is effective as our earliest results suggest, it could be a major impact in our fight against COVID-19. It's more like a fight against bureaucracies than basically the COVID because these are wonderful research uh, uh, discoveries. And I waited to see them incorporated. Uh, I know someone's going to say, well, it's far more complicated than that. N no, I don't think so. Inhaled heparin has antiviral properties which work by binding to the spike proteins. Remember we did that? That was, uh, what else bind the spike proteins? Recall um, cannabidiol, uh, cannabidiolic acids and CB, uh, CBGA and C uh, CBDGA and CB, you know, you get the idea. The acids, not the CBD itself. It's the acids, the precursors. Proteins and coronavirus is used to enter the cells in the body. Inhaled heparin effectively stops the virus infecting cells in the lungs and could also stop people from getting the virus from others. Again, a lot of people have been uh, definitely uh, terrified of COVID for quite some time because of very susceptible, uh, you know, emotional impact. So you can do something like this and say, hey, you think been expensive COVID? Let me take a, a deep breath of heparin real fast. All right, let's do it. You know, give them a tool to which they can operate effectively in society. Because some people have been so traumatized by this whole pandemic mitigation thing, they don't think they're ever going to leave their house. Says he added, there's no other drug that has these three different effects, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, and anticoagulant. 
Heparin is normally administered via injection. However, this, however, when inhaled, the drug shows promise as a treatment for COVID-19. The authors will continue to collect evidence that inhaled heparin works as a treatment and prevention for COVID-19. You know, if we spent less time, you know, getting angry at people for not doing the things that we like them to do, the way we like them to do it, and just more ways of finding ways to help people in a format that makes them feel comfortable, I think we'd have arose from this pandemic a long time ago. But next one, here we go. Da -da -da. Another great study. HKU scientists real orally administered bismuth drug together with N-acetylcysteine. Remember, the FDA wanted to take N-acetylcysteine off the market, and N-acetylcysteine keeps on rising, uh, uh, should rise, rising, rising, raising its head every once in a while in reference to the COVID-19 pandemic. Makes you kind of wonder, doesn't it? Uh, FDA is not too transparent these days, are they? Uh, N-acetylcysteine is a potential broad-spectrum anti-coronavirus cocktail therapy. Here we go. Discovered that orally administered bismuth drug, colloidal bismuth uh, substitute together with N-acetylcysteine could be a broad-spectrum anti-coronavirus cocktail therapy. I think, what was it, 297, now we're on 298, whatever is prophylactic treatment. Bismuth subsequently suppressed virus replication of a panel of clinically relevant coronaviruses. And the cool part about this, it is so broad-spectrum. Uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, MERS, remember that? Uh, human coronavirus 229E, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS CoV 2, and its alpha variant by inactivating the multiple essential viral enzymes. So simple, basic, and effective. Because look at what's happened here. The heparin itself, like for example, like other elements, it's not attempting to increase the immune system, produce antibodies, produce T cell or B cell, which you'll hear often in reference to inoculations. You know, or do inoculations work at all? You know, do they have any B cell memory, T cell memory to any extent that's going to be effective? Uh, or do they imprint? Meaning you can fight last year's virus very effectively, but the problem is this year's virus, your body doesn't adapt to as well. But how does it imprint it? But here it is. Rantadine bismuth citrate, commercial name, pylorid, a drug in clinical use for the treatment of Helicobacter pylori infection, remember? as a potent anti-SARS-CoV-2 agent, both in vitro and in vivo. And so basically when they added the N-acetylcysteine to it, it basically made it really, 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 really good. So you get the idea. All the links to that as well. And um, again, prophylactic treatment number 298. After that, the seroprevalence, we covered that. The seroprevalence of COVID-19 workers in Malaysia. Uh, does it mean anything? Uh, I don't know. Does it mean that herd mentality has been achieved? Herd, herd mentality, please forgive me. Uh, herd immunity has been achieved? Well, yeah, herd mentality, we already know. If you're watching this video, you're trying to escape the herd mentality. But how outside of that, has herd immunity been achieved? Well, among migrant workers, uh, wow. I don't think they're 100% vaccinated. Let's put it that way. All right, after that. Uh, performance of commonly used COVID-19 lateral flow test for kids below par. And it is way below par. It says the children's of lateral flow antigen test commonly used to detect COVID-19 infection. So you have to think about this for a second. We're so maniacal in making sure we test everybody and test them, test them, test them, test them. But the tests suck. And so you're going through the motion either to give a false sense of security or whatever it is, but they... If you, you enact they, they enact these laws and rules based upon hyperbole. Yeah, if the tests work perfectly, I can understand why you're testing. But if the tests have a huge failure rate, then, then, then it's like getting in a car with no brakes. Sometimes it's better just not to get into the car. Sometimes maybe better just to say, hey, how do you feel? As opposed to basically, oh, your tests show are negative. The findings cast out in the effectiveness of the widespread testing in schools suggest the researchers. Here we go. The data from all 17 studies were pulled to measure the diagnostic sensitivity and specificity of the test. Sensitivity indicates how well a test picks up people who have a disease or infection. Specificity indicates how well the test picks up for those who don't. The sensitivity of the evaluated tests was just over 64%. So which means, you know, 36% of the people which are infected uh, joined the classroom. And after that, uh, among children with symptoms, it was just 72%, a little bit better, but still a failure. 
And children without symptoms, you're asymptomatic, you know, scary kids who don't seem to be sick but are carrying, according to a lot of the um, educational establishment, just over 56%. So it's basically, it's almost like you can have about the same results just by flipping a coin. But if you basically said, hey, you know, you know, how do you feel, this, that, or whatever it is, um, you know, whatever it came down to be, you know, there eight, no symptoms, but, you know, that means every kid that comes to the door, you basically might as well flip a coin. Heads up, you're ill. Tails, you're not. So that's basically your accuracy when it comes to children in regard to, what is it? Sensitivity. How well it picks up a disease or infection. 56%. Think about that. Sensitivity estimates of antigen tests varied broadly among studies and were substantially lower than reported by manufacturers. Oh, what a surprise that is. Although the intended use of most of the tests is limited to people with symptoms. So performance data reported by manufacturers usually refers only to those with symptoms. The tests weren't even designed to pick up a lot of the asymptomatic diseases, what they're trying to say. I, even though I don't know what the, um, what the manufacturers state. Take into account the test-specific pool results. No test included in this review fully satisfied the minimum minimum performance requirements as recommended by the World Health Organization or the FDA or the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Commission in the UK. But what the heck? We'll use them anyways. And so the story unfolds. Whether this can be compensated with frequent testing remains a moot point. So it means if the test doesn't work the first time, uh, doing the test more often is not going to make it work any better. Inoculations, vaccines? No, oh, sorry, we're talking tests. All right, lateral, lateral tests to be more specific. Again, the links will be there for you to follow as well. And here we go again, lightning. They're trying to find out what spurs the mutations. And for example, a long time ago, it was speculated that like the sun goes through an 11 year cycle of, uh, of intense solar flare activity. So they thought, for example, that viruses like influenza and things like that would mutate in reference to the additional radiation in the atmosphere. Well, they're trying to come up along the same conjecture environmentally to see exactly what's spurring uh, the mutations. Outside, you know, it could be something more innocuous like leaky vaccines or, or antibody therapies in which basically someone becomes a, uh, a carrier, what they would call often in polio, a wild excreter. But in this case, and from an environmental standpoint, let's read forward. The mutants result from biological interactions changing and streamlining genetic material, knocking out certain traits and improving others. But might there be another potentially global cause of variance? And this is when they come down to basically lightning. Answers may be in the sky and the sea, according to a new paper available online. Now, researchers basically said that they want to investigate the role of nitric oxide. Again, it pops up again. A molecule known to damage and mutate genetic material in the COVID-19 variants. Nitric oxide is produced through both the biological process and environmental events such as lightning and seawater intrusion. So lightning by the sea. While people naturally produce nitric oxide, they can consume it from the environment. Lightning produces high temperatures that break down atmospheric nitrogen into nitrogen oxides, which dissolve in the rain and combine with the water to form nitrate that falls to the planet's surface and becomes fertilizer for plants. Interesting. Humans eat the plants, including the nitrates which they eventually break down to nitric oxide. The molecule is also abundant in seawater, which feeds the groundwater and coastal areas entering the cycle by watering the plants, animals, and people consume. Noting that alpha, beta, gamma, eta, and delta lineages were all first detected near coast. Omicron, which had not emerged at the time of the report, was first detected in Botswana in South Africa, while Botswana is landlocked, it shares a border with South Africa, which is extensive coastline meeting the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. So basically, just food for thought, not food for nitric oxide or nitrates, but food for thought that this keeps on coming into the role. So interesting, if we start going through a season of heavy lightning or atmospheric electricity or whatever it is, uh, if uh, mutations are occurring in those areas where there's intense lightning or you know electric activity as such. Now let's proceed forward. Health decline, I right, went through this. Yeah, lockdowns, People, I, the amount of people that think that lockdowns and masking 
and everything else like that have no collateral damage outside of basically what they're doing. Um, no, it does tremendous collateral damage. The question is now, the difference is the collateral damage that's caused by the lockdowns may take years to actually see the full results of. But by that time, once you begin this domino effect, how do you reverse it? Proceed. Uh, after the schools again, went through that. And then the democracy. I want to reiterate that once again. In the U.S., the people who consider democracy a bad way to run the country more than doubled. 10.5 to 25.8%. Wow. All right. You have the link for this article as well. I just, again, does not, don't get angry at the researchers. I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of bias and added to basically the explanation of the article itself. But however, though, um, yeah, if that's what the data comes out to be, then we have to face it. Close to one quarter of the country uh, thinks democracy is a bad way to run our republic, per se. All right, you see what I mean? Let's begin. All right, another, these are just the two reactions to look at, uh, but they give great explanations of how these reactions occur in reference to basically inoculation. Atypical Kawasaki disease after COVID-19 vaccination a new form of adverse event following immunization. Just things to keep it track of uh, because again, you ask a person what is a effect of a vaccine and um, you know, a lot of times people don't know what to look for. What is a side effect of a vaccine? Uh, or what uh, adverse event, sorry, not a side effect, adverse event uh, to a vaccine or inoculation. You don't often know what it is. You don't know what to look for, you know, and a lot of these things take a long time to arise. Uh, so it could take decades and it could happen from uh, immune imprinting like we discussed before, but proceed. We report a case of male adult, blah, 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 manifested the Kawasaki disease is noted after receiving COVID-19 vaccine. Um, reported, this has been reported previously with pneumococcal vaccine, but not in COVID until now. All right. While allergic reactions are immune mediated, not all immune mediated reactions are allergic. On the other hand, vaccination has been associated as a possible trigger for autoimmune, autoinflammatory, or mixed disease phenotype. Kawasaki disease is an acute multisystemic vasculitis manifested by a constellation of signs and symptoms, including fever, polymorphic rash, conjunctival injection, cervical lymph lymphadenopathy, a change in the oral mucosa, such as arrhythmia and cracking of lips, strawberry tongue, Diffuse injection, oral pharyngeal mucosa, and characteristic changes in the extremities, such as desquamation, arrhythmia, and edema, and the palms and the soles. All right, so that's the reaction. That's probably a little bit more than you need to know. Uh, but it gives an idea of another one of many uh, potential um, adverse events to start looking for. Gosh forbid, I hope you don't have to, but if it occurs, you may be able to draw a correlation. And after that, Polyandritis craniosynovitis, cranial, uh, associated with BNT 162.2, another one to look for in healthy adolescent. All right, to proceed down what further? Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, you, it's exactly what you think it is. Post-vaccination neuropathy has been reported previously. Peripheral nerve biopsies performed on three patients who had neuropath neuropathies after vaccination confirmed the presence of inflammatory deposits in the endonerium. Uh, Immune-mediated inflammatory demyelation of the cranial nerves was the most likely mechanism. Huh? Immune-mediated inflammatory demyelation of the cranial nerves was most likely mechanism. Uh, this basically happened, now as far as to look out for, developed three hours after the administration of the first dose. All right. The overall risk of neurological campa uh, campaigns, campaigns, Camp it is a campaign, isn't it? It's an inoculation campaign. Neurological complications remains low. But again, uh, a lot of people recover. But however, though, if all of a sudden, you know, after someone gets a vaccine and, you know, Gou uh, Guillaume Barre or whatever, Guillaume Barre, we want to say Guillaume Barre, uh, and at least they know possibly that this may not be a permanent effect. It may just go away. But again, just something else to look forward to. Uh, not look forward to look forward. Sorry, it's the wrong language. I'm speaking too fast. I'll uh, look, keep an eye out for later on. Now let's go into the British Medical Journal. 
this was really kind of what happened. Uh, British Medical Journal, I really admire. And they were the ones uh, that basically, they broke most of the scandals uh, in reference to vaccines and medications. In fact, uh, let's see, we'll go real fast here. Hang on one second. 12 years ago, the British Medical Journal uh, released raw trial data of the antiviral drug Tamiflu. Remember that? After it came to light that governments around the world had spent billions stockpiling antivirals that had not been shown to reduce the risk of influenza complications, hospital admission, or death. And of course, back then, it was the same thing. Trust the science. No, no, because there was lots of science that came out and said, no, this does not work. And remember in Japan, uh, when they were administering the Tamiflu and kids started having hallucinations and reactions and, and suicidal ideation, and then it got out of control. Perceived, uh, especially since the risk was so low to kids. Despite global action, that, that one was actually higher to kids than the current one. Um, said, quote, this is today's despite global rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, participants level data try to Level data underlying the trials for these new products remains inaccessible to doctors. I will reiterate, today, despite the global rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, the participant level data underlying the trials for these new products remains inaccessible to doctors, researchers, and the public. So when a medical professional comes up to you and says, well, these vaccines are perfectly safe, the most studied thing ever since, but da da no, they're propagandizing. They can't possibly know because they don't have access to the data. So they're trusting someone else. So it's either the most trusted vaccine or the most researched vaccine. And it's not the most researched. It's the most trusted, yes. But again, it's only because if they're not trusted, then that brings up uh, other questions in regard to motivations. But in this case, what is written, this is morally indefensible for all trials, especially those involving major health public interventions. Major is an understatement. Let's just say global. They point out that Pfizer's pivotal COVID vaccine trial was funded by the company, designed, run, analyzed, and authored by Pfizer employees. The company and the contract research organizations that carried out the, the trial hold all the data, but Pfizer has indicated that it will not begin entertaining a request for trial data until May 2025. Well, in May 2025, I'm going to start entertaining whether I should get that vaccine or not. That's just the way I feel. Again, everyone's to their own right. If you want to basically uh, inoculate yourself multiple times every four months, six months, and but at least you get to buy food and go to movie theaters in Washington, D.C. I don't, but again, big loss. Uh, yeah, but you know, if you want to be coerced by your mayors and your city officials into getting inoculated uh, because for something which no one has any access to? Yeah, that's your prerogative. Moderna says, quote, may be available for publication of the final study results in 2022. That's very pleasant. And as it's December 31st, 2021, AstraZeneca may be ready to entertain requests for data from several of its large phase three trials. Wait, 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 what, what year is it? But as websites explain, timelines vary per request and can take up to a year upon full submission of the request. So it's January 2022. Did anybody see anything from AstraZeneca? This is worrying for trial participants, researchers, clinicians, journal editors, and the public. Why isn't any public uproar? I mean, seriously. Like, what the heck? The BMJ supports vaccination policy based on sound evidence. They write, as the global vaccine rollout continues, it cannot be justifiable or in the best interest of patients and the public that we are just left to trust in the system. With yeah, not just trust in the system, if you, if you question the system, you're basically derided socially. And I saw it's like, you know, tremendously and you're mocked. And you're called not smart, and you're called a coward, and you're called aversive, and you're called disease carrying, uh, just for the mere questioning. It's scary to ask questions these days, but BMJ has no problem with it. With a distant hope that underlying data may become available for independent scrutiny at some point in the future. It's nothing to do with trusting a vaccine or not trusting a vaccine. It's saying 
I don't trust the study in which you're unwilling to show me the data. All right. What's more, more the public paid. People don't realize it too. Public paid for COVID-19 vaccines through vast public funding and research. And it's the public that takes on the balance of benefits and harms that accompany vaccination. The public therefore has a right and entitlement to those data. It's our data. It's data. We data. We paid for it. They profit from it as well as the, uh, the interrogation of those data by experts. And there obviously is a problem because if the vaccines worked as effectively as originally marketed to us, we wouldn't be at the stage of the game at this point in time. But again, even the BMJ said in the beginning, and the Lancet did, and New England Medical Journal, before basically started getting a lot of their, their studies being published in there, um, you know, what the heck? The purpose of regulators is not to the purpose of regulators is not to dance. Let's get that right there. To the tune of rich global corporations and enrich them, it is to protect their health of the populations. We need to complete data transparency for all studies. We need it in the public interest, and we need it now. So basically, think about your your your, uh, your bureaucrats, regardless of the country that you're in. And they're forcing you to inoculate your kids with data which they don't even have access to. Seriously, is that leadership? Or is that just grabbing at straws? They're injecting, inoculating the children of the world many times against the parents' own desires and concerns just to prove what? Because they obviously can't prove that it works or not if they don't have the data available to them. And that's when we come to the next one. Are you ready? Here we go to Facebook. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry about, you know, going on a rant to reference to that. But I am dismayed on a daily basis at how readily uh, conformity uh, to basically when something's said in confidence and how quickly people conform. I don't know if they're conforming out of confidence in the information or conforming out of fear of retribution. And that may go down to other things, but to proceed. The BMJ announces appeal after Facebook fails to act over incompetent fact check of investigation. They're not holding any punches. Facebook is trying to control how people think into the guise of fact checking, warns editor in chief. The BMJ has locked horns with Facebook and the gatekeepers of international fact checking after one of its investigations was wrongly labeled with missing context and censored on the world's largest social network. I mean, we're talking the British Medical Journal. The British Medical Journal, all right? To proceed. And I'm not going to call out any names of any, of any Facebook CEOs, but here we are. Despite not identifying anything false or inaccurate in the BMJ's investigation, the lead story has declined to remove its article. So basically saying, hey, they're going to say it's censored. The BMJ's editor-in-chief said, we should all be very worried that Facebook, a multi-billion dollar company, is effectively censoring fully fact-checked journalism that is raising legitimate concerns about the conduct of clinical trials. And remember, this was basically in reference to the Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca trials as brought up in the prior article. And they just happened to coincide with each other. And... Remember, there were whistleblowers that came out in reference to the Pfizer trial, you know, with brought up some solid questions. And the British Medical Journal was just reporting factually. But obviously what happened was those facts uh, were not conforming to the general uh, consensus of social media giants. And so what do you do? If you don't like the facts, you change the story. You get rid of the facts you don't like and you impose uh, your fantasy facts on the population. And that's, you know, there's got to be a point in time when these multimedia organizations were knowingly censoring information that can basically improve or at least help individuals avoid potential harm or risk-benefit ratios which are inaccurate or misrepresented, that they become legally liable themselves. Proceed. Facebook's actions won't start. The BMJ, especially if they take a factual article that's correct and label it false, that that type of disparagement goes beyond just mere censorship. All right, to proceed. Facebook's actions won't stop. The BM general doing what is right. 
But the real question is, why is Facebook acting in this way? What is driving its worldview? Is it ideology? Is it commercial interest? Is it incompetence? Users should be worried that despite presenting itself as neutral social media platforms, Facebook is trying to control how people think under the guise of fact checking. I'm gonna leave it at that. Now I deal with some of the Facebook people and personnel and a lot of the Facebook people I deal with are on the front line. Again, it's like everything with the CDC and basically National Institute of Health and so on and so forth. A lot of the people that go in on a day in and day out basis, they're not bureaucrats, they're not appointees, and they actually do a decent job and they're actually really good people like everyone else. I don't wanna say like you and I, like they're some sort of separate race. But however though, it's it, usually the problem is they are adhering to someone else's ideology at the top. And I don't wanna paint an entire organization of people in a light which is not favorable, especially since a lot of them are just, for example, uh, in a position where they don't have much freedom to proceed. And everyone's been in a place of employment from time to time where you can't do what you think is best because of the leadership position at that particular company. Next, vaccine used in much of the world, no match for Omicron variant. And we're talking, now keep in mind, people don't realize too, there's more than one vaccine out there. And a lot of the world have been vaccinated with this vaccine and considered fully vaccinated. And then he found out against Omicron. This is the weird part. Now think about this. No neutralizing antibodies. Now, I would have liked to see that compared to individuals which have natural immunity, but, oops, sorry about that, produce no neutralizing antibodies. Is that, I mean, I, that's a very strong statement to state. And I'd like to know whether, why they produce, I mean, no. Even if they had some sort of prior exposure, seroprevalence, you expect some antibodies to be produced, but none after two shots. And then when researchers compared the samples with blood serum at Yale, they found that even those that received two Sinovac shots and a booster had antibody levels that were only about the same as those who received two shots of the mRNA vaccine. Now, keep in mind, two shots of the mRNA vaccine had a negative vaccine effectiveness of negative point zero uh, negative zero point six. So I don't know if that is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and said an additional booster shot and possibly two are included needed in areas of the globe. I'm talking two booster shots, not two shots in a booster. So basically you see where this is going on and on and on and on. All right, and then after that, we want that. And then I think that is it. We are ready to go into the data analysis and we got it done in about an hour ahead of time. And let's just look at our various disclaimer. Various disclaimer is as follows. Do says, while very important monitoring vaccine safety, various reports can alone cannot be used to determine vaccine concerns or contribute to the adverse uh, event and illness. The reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. In large part because various are voluntary, which means they are subject to biases. So just keep that in mind. Regular people uh, making reports, and a lot of times when I read through these reports, they are they are interesting. There's some correlations with basically vaccine adverse reactions. They may have nothing to do uh, with the vaccine itself. Someone may trip and fall and hurt their head, and they'll blame it on the vaccine, even though it could be the ice on the sidewalk. You see what I mean? Yeah, it requires investigation, but to proceed as follows, and also too, the other data source I want to bring up is our world in data too. That's one of our data sources, and I, I, they're, they're, they're great, 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 great. But here goes the data as follows. Da -da -da. All right, we looked at this. There is our various file comparison. First two weeks of 2022 is larger than, you got it, any year up to 2006, and by next week, and I, I probably won't be here next week. I probably won't be here for about another 30 days. I have thousands of miles I have to travel in the next month, but I shall return. Uh, we'll, we'll follow up uh, just for, if any reason, for nostalgic reasons, uh, probably in uh, early March. All right. Uh, but I'll be gone for quite some time. I have a long, I have a lot of traveling to do. All right. Proceed. So let's go over the rest of the way here. Do, 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 whoops, wrong way. And this is, uh, you see 2022 right down there? Because red along red doesn't help you. 
Uh, there it is. And you can get an idea as far as bubble size. And let's see real fast. I have anything else here that's of interest? No, nothing necessarily yet. And let's go to our next one. Let's go to rebuild. Now let's go to the United States. We'll look at the data from the United States. Here we go. Ba -ba -ba. All right. Age mortality breakdown. Notice anything different here? Right there. What happened was most of the mortality was in the 85 or older group. Uh, if you're in a country which has luxury of having a longer life expectancy, then all of a sudden now the 75 to 84 group is catching up with the 85 an older group, which is an interesting trend. And the 65 to 75 is beginning to catch up with the 85 and older group. But as far as the younger individuals since the pandemic began, according to the CDC figures, um, you know, really hasn't had anywhere near the impact. Thank goodness. I mean, every life is precious. You're going to hear that quite often. Uh, but, you know, no comparison. No comparison. All right, let's proceed downward. And go do, 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 do. let's see the data here. Data, 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 data. I didn't see much movement in the hospital occupancies. I know what they're saying, but I, I didn't see it. Uh, mortality, would you see a rise of mortality in a, lot of individ, in a lot of places? You notice right here again, mortality is at, ah, oh, what happened? Oh, thank you, OneDrive. Uh, mortality right here is higher than it was in the beginning. So I don't know, but let's go down. I mean, I expected, in fact, it's been steadily higher. I know Omicron nowhere near as lethal, but these figures are weird. All right, proceed. Up, oh, go down. Do, 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 do. All right, here we go. Our favorite comparisons between Florida, California, New York, and Texas. So we have maniacal lockdowns versus just basically party all night. New death smooth per 100,000. Ready? Here we go. Week. Florida. Party central. All of your favorite politicians go there one time or another. I think even Nancy Pelosi bought a house in Florida recently. So something about Florida that attracts people. Interesting. Uh, Texas mortality, 2.73. Is what about the same? Yeah, it's actually lower than New York. And of course, Florida is much lower than California. Uh, and California is still in pandemic mode. Florida is more in party mode. So I, again, from an observational standpoint, I don't see much credence to what they're doing. In New York, which is really maniacal, uh, regardless of vaccine mandates and mass mandates and distancing, observationally, those, those figures are tough to argue. It sucks. It really sucks. Observationally for Florida, are they just lucky? Or is Sarah prevalence better? Or is disease uh, not as um, ravaging when people are happy? Yeah, not the mood and, and illness have any connection with each other. All right, to proceed. Dun, 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 dun. And here we are. See how it's beginning to fall? See that drop? You know, we pretend like we could, we're controlling the environment somehow, but reality? No, it's just doing its own thing. And then if you're lucky in your, you know, office at a certain time, you can start taking credit for it if you want to. But otherwise, outside of that, observationally, everything they've done seems, eh. All right, let's look at COVID. This is uh, COVID. Let's look at the COVID vaccines. All right? Oh, real fast. What this is right here is this is, well, I'm going to have to go up to show you first. All right. So what we're looking at right here is just the 2022. Uh, now I'll take that back. This is all of the non-duplicated mortality reports by age, as far as breakdown, so on and so forth. So mortality is now reported at, to mortality reports to VAERS is now 10,103. And we're including 2021 and 2022 combined. So keep that in mind. All right, then we look at non-duplicated mortality reports. Uh, if you want to look at, I don't think we have, oh, we do have it broken down here. Uh, these are the des descriptions. Uh, yeah, someone spent a lot of time working on that one. 
Um, you can see, for example, a lot of their stories, which I feel is real important, especially we try and look for safety signals. You know, a lot of these reports are quite intense and long, and they're more and more um, younger individuals, uh, per se, which have correlation potentially uh, with I don't know what will happen here. Um, with vaccine adverse reactions in reference to basically uh, the uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, yeah, and that's what they are. Non-duplicated mortality reports. Go down. Now, what you see right here is vaccine dose series. Now, what we're looking at is right here, three. Three would be basically, number, which should, should indicate the number of boosters. But a lot of individuals who are filling out these reports don't understand them. So you'll have vaccine series all across the board, but three should be boosters and possibly four should be boosters. So when you start seeing, you know, weird numbers, it's probably because it's a misprint. I don't think anybody received, maybe it's possible that certain individuals may have received seven COVID vaccines. You know what I mean? But I think that's more of a uh, misnomer as opposed to actual accurate data. That's what needs to be researched. But to proceed forward, now this is going to be important because we're going to look at all the reactions from three doses or more. But to proceed, most, now check this out. Most of the reactions, oh, it's at 720,512 reactions so far reported to Veros. This is generalized. Now check this out. Headache, fatigue, chills, dizziness, pain, all looks pretty much the same. Now, let's look at the reactions when a person has three shots or more. You ready for this? Check this out. Reported boost reactions to bears from January 1st, which there weren't many boosters up there, uh, 2021 to January 22nd, 2022. Or actually, should say January 14th, be more realistic. What do you see? Expired product administered, product storage error, extra dose administered, you see a different type of vaccine reaction uh, when it comes to the boosters than you do from basically people which have a generalized reaction to an inoculation. And look at chest pain. Chest pain is coming up there now. That I was su surprised that's up there. So 20,833 reports of chest pain. But however, though, we here we have like 7,447 reports of being administered expired product or storage errors. So the top 20 reactions for boosters, three doses or more, we'll just call it, because the same vaccine anyways, just taking more often, um, begins to change once you get past midpoint. And you get some pretty reckless uh, reports as far as uh, you can tell expired product. Because think about it. If it's the same vaccine, just for example, given three doses, we'll just call it booster to make it sound like it's different, then there, it's possible that wherever the, the uh, administration site is, they're just getting rid of their stuff that's expired or before it or is close to expiration. But that should never happen, period. This I can understand there's a problem with refrigeration or whatever it is, but this... You just got to check the date. <laughs> but still, in this one, did would you lose count? Three, four, five? I don't know. All right, proceed forward. All right, and I think that's it for that one. Let's go to the VARES 2022. Now, we're just looking at the VARES vaccine adverse event reports for basically January to 20, uh, January, you know, 1st, 2022 to now. So that's what we got. Da, da, da. And these are individuals that basically have succumbed within one day of the shot so far this year. I don't like talking like that way, but there it is. Uh, I need to, oh, I need to fix this still. Um, you know, the youngest individual is 37. Um, as far as, again, mortality reports. I'll fix this next time, I promise. I don't know why it's not coming up there. Uh, long range reports, 11 days or more. Let's go through here. Uh, mortality within 10 days of the shot, 36. You notice the age gone down. 
that I don't. Again, you see reports like this, they're not so much detailed in reference to what they are, uh, but they're coming in. Uh, you know, it's you could in beginning now, especially more than anything else, you could see uh, patterns when they develop. And so you see heart attack, you see basically myocardial infarction, you see, you start seeing those, the commonness, cardiac arrest, uh, those safety signals begin to arise a lot earlier. All right, proceed forward. Oops, wrong way. All right, that is non-duplicated reports of errors. Uh, da, 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 and reference, oh, so far this year, 15,546 reports of errors. So from January 1st, to actually it's January 14th, but I just had this pop up with today's date. There's been 15,546 uh, adverse events reported to Veros. And this is the age going down here, as you can see. All right, proceed forward. Uh, re uh, reports to Veros, these could be duplicated. So I'm gonna pass on this one real fast. Uh, Myocarditis re reports to Veros, 176 from the beginning of this year so far. I don't think I have it to where, nope, does break that down. Uh, yep, 176. And then let's see if there's any further data. No, I think that's if the data. We don't have Europe this time because Europe um, did not have any update, did not update your Dura Vigilance. And so that's gonna basically close it out for her data uh, per se. And I think we already covered this in the beginning, the web scraping in reference to basically the size of the various data set. So to review what we covered so far tonight, let us go backwards to proceed. All right, vaccine effectiveness, basically somewhere around the negative 0.6 from two doses, but uh, basically most of the, one of the major vaccines used around the world, uh, no neutralizing antibodies, we'll go through that. British Medical Journal, Facebook decides to ban probably the most credible organization on the planet uh, or ban its article, I should say, because it's fact checkers, which are not medical professionals, um, said that the medical professionals who are producing medical information are factual. All right, after that, let's see, uh, because it doesn't go with their virtues. Uh, do we look at this? Editors call for COVID-19 treatment to be availability. I mean, we all like knock on Pfizer, but you know what? That's funny, you don't even see Janssen and Janssen in there anymore, Johnson and Johnson, whatever you call it. It's like fade into obscurity. But no one's playing nice, and I don't like it. And if they don't play nice, it, then why should I trust them at, through co coercion? I feel sorry for all the people that have jobs, which they have no choice to basically get vaccinated uh, based upon management, short sighted management and leader, company leadership. All right, potential new uh, reactions arising in reference to being identified in reference to some of the inoculations. Um, after that, again, I will repeat this over and over again, decline in democratic support. People like the technocrats better and they don't like politicians well, so they'll trust some of the individuals who claim to be scientists or claim to be science themselves. And freedom of will of the people and looking for corrupt elitism is no longer an in thing, I guess, among people that have succumbed to the COVID-19 pandemic mitigation uh, strategies, not the disease. Uh, kids out of school, bad news. Uh, health for individuals, gonna have collateral effects way down the line, not even speaking about dysbiosis of the separation of the microbiome uh, between lung and so on and so forth and immune. Nitric oxide, again, plays a role. Article number four, are very serious about nitric oxide now. They know it has something to do with the mutation of the virus in the environment, but they're, they're beginning to look at it more and more individual reports. Uh, lightning being really interesting. Uh, the most common used test to treat, to test kids in school, uh, really kind of uh, basically sucks, which we went through. And then seroprevalence, some individuals, the meek shall inherit the earth, and it looks like the meek pretty much have 100% seroprevalence, um, especially these poor individuals, these migrant workers working in these countries, while people which live under pandemic mitigation uh, lockdowns, no. All right, let's see. 
great discovery, a reference to basically medication for H. pylori and an acetylcysteine combination. Um, heparin, again, I'm just dismayed on how popular this drug has been in research, but yet how little it has been deployed uh, among the population, especially in high heparin. Uh, it looks real promising. Uh, more studies in reference to this than the trusted inoculations. At least this information is public. All right, after that, uh, we look at this. Do, do, do. Wonderful, wonderful nutritional therapy in reference to helping individuals with stage three and comorbidities. A randomized, blind, randomized controlled trial had incredible results. We'll look at it real fast before we close out. That is just, I mean, look at that. That's incredible. I mean, seriously. I mean, for the cost of a couple of painkillers in a hospital uh, per day, you could do incredible things to help people. To bring mortality from 17.5% down to 2.5%, Seriously, in people which are really have, which are really uh, stage three, come on. I mean, I, again, I'm just, I'm just, I'm dismayed that these aren't being incorporated in a, a larger arena. All right, then after that, we go to my favorite, one of my favorites for, for a long period of time, which has a lot of research done on it, but somehow has never made it to the, uh, uh, to Western medicine, is Ching Fei Pai Tu Tong. And if I mispronounce that, again, please forgive me. I try and do the best I possibly can. And I, I am humbled, and you can correct me as often as you like. I, but I don't take any offense whatsoever. In fact, I enjoy learning the right way to pronounce it. And I believe it's Ching Fei Pai Tu Tong. Believe. Again, I don't know. Uh, but however, though, again, so effective, so positive, with nearly all patients recovering from it, back so long ago, that basically I will make sure that this link is there so you can research and look at it on your own and then basically see how many studies have done to basically confirm the findings in this study since then. Yet, have any of you heard about any of our news media? Probably not. Our news media, which is interesting, it's great at polarizing each other. And somehow you think something's going to get done because by complaining, somehow action is supposed to take place. But no. Uh, Giving individuals the tools in which to help themselves is probably the greatest, uh, basically, gift that you can give a population in reference to self-determination, freedom, independence, and being able to take care of themselves. That's the whole goal, I believe, in my humble opinion, that any bureaucratic establishment or any sort of uh, proclaimed uh, government should have in partnership with the citizenry. Remember, governments don't exist without people, period. But somehow governments have now seen themselves better than people. You don't believe me? Look at your lockdowns. All right, again, Ralph Channel signing off once again. Thank you very much. Oh, it's 118 wheels of an hour and 18 minutes. All right, guys, I'll catch you all next time. Again, I'll be gone probably for the next 30 days. And hopefully this whole thing is over in the next month. But if not, I will resume it again uh, in one month. I'll do one more video coming up this week in regards to something specific in regards to, you know, the uh, health element or nutritional supplement. But outside of that, gratitude. Thank you. Please forgive me. I talk kind of fast, had a lot of ground to cover, but still just the same. I hope there's information in this research that you utilize uh, basically to not necessarily improve your own life, but the lives of others and get this thing over with. All right. Catch you all in a bit. See you next time. Bye.